Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to Outlaws of Alkenstar GM Prep. I am Steve, and I will be your guide through this journey into the city of Smog, Alkenstar. Now, some of you may be wondering, who the heck is this guy anyways? Well, I wanted to start by just giving a little bit of information about myself, who I am, why you might care. Um, anyway, my name, like I said, it's Steve. And um, a few years ago, I used to be a huge fan of 5th edition dungeon mastering. And I was a big event organizer. We had a group that we ran at our local game shop that we ran every other week that got too big. So we had to run it every week. And we were running about 50 people every week. And we were organizing like our own custom games and event planning and all of that. And I was really, really, really into the, the, the hobby. And then when COVID hit, we sort of transitioned to playing online. And I kind of found myself wandering and checking out other games in that sort of downtime, Pathfinder 2nd Edition being one of them. I picked it up from the Humble Bundle, and it was a lot of fun. And I definitely convince my group to start playing it and once we switched over it's hard to go back and we love fifth edition now oh, we, we love second edition now much more than we love fifth edition so um i've been running exclusively second edition in my free time ever since um now all that being said i am 100 percent not proclaiming that i am the best gm or that i'm even in authority in this space whatsoever uh, I do offer my passion, I do offer my insight, and I do have a sort of knack of running published campaigns as the sort of cornerstone of my GMing style. Um, over the last four years, I've ran, you know, in terms of like published material and published campaigns, I've ran uh, Waterdeep Dragon Heist twice, I ran Descent into Avernus twice, I ran Ghosts of Saltmarsh uh, part of the way through. I ran about three homebrew campaigns. I ran a bunch of games in that world that I told you about, the the sort of pre-planning or the, the bi-weekly organized group that we have. And as of last year, we ran through and completed the entirety of the Abomination Vaults in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. So I do have a knack for sort of digesting and finding a way to deal with that huge deluge that like flood of information that running an adventure path has when they just like dump three books with their content on you or like you know 250 pages and you got to absorb it all and it seems overwhelming i've gotten pretty good at that and that's what i'm going to be doing here is helping you guys to navigate that flood of information and hopefully offer you a lifeboat for those of you who might feel overwhelmed who are just getting into pathfinder or for gms that just want a different perspective on it right so this is what I call the GM prep series. Um, the GM prep started last year when I realized that there wasn't really a ton of information for GMs out there. There's tons of player facing guides and information, right? You got class builds, you got class guides, you got build guides, you got best gear guides, spell rankings, tier lists. But for a GM, everything is kind of left to do on their own. And, you know, it's, it's a hard job and I personally felt like if I was going to run a pre-published adventure, I learned best by watching other people run it. And so that's what I did when I was learning how to GM was watch other GMs run the content I was going to and absorb what they're doing. Um, and last year I actually launched a GM prep for the Abomination Vaults that was kind of helping me prep the material as well as the audience. And, um, I did do six episodes last year covering the first book of that adventure path. It's a three book adventure path. I covered the entire first book, um, Runes of Gauntlet. And at the time, I actually didn't feel like it was getting the traction I had hoped it was because I was like, oh, this is awesome content. The GMs out there are going to want it. It just didn't really get the traction at the time, at least, um, that I was hoping for. So it just, with my time commitment and, and being stretched thin with all the stuff I want to make, it kind of fell off the back burner, right? I didn't think there was a desire for the content. And so I didn't continue past that first book. 
Interestingly, though, Abomination Vault has a lot of staying power. And over the last year, more and more GMs have found that video and found that content. And we're to the point where the most commented video I have on the whole Recall Knowledge channel is, hey, did you ever finish this? Hey, are you going to finish this? Hey, is there more of these videos? And so that to me was really interesting. And what it tells me is there is a demand for this out there. And there is GMs who really do like this sort of content, even if the numbers are not as big as maybe an actual play or a Foundry Quick Tips video or something like that. So um, I am bringing back the GM prep series. Thank you uh, in chat for Hydrate. I am bringing back the GM prep series here. Um, and in this series, I'm going to be directly talking to you, the GMs. 100% this is a spoiler filled video series. If you're a player, you're not allowed here. Get out of here. You know, not Richard in the chat. I see you get out because uh, you're one of my players, right? So the idea is we're going to cover everything that a GM needs to know. Uh, we're going to start by basically covering the entire adventure path at a high level, making sure you understand a big picture sort of look at the world. Um, we're going to be talking about specific chapters. Usually what I do is each episode is about an hour and I'll cover one specific chapter of that adventure. In Abomination Vaults, one chapter meant one floor of the dungeon. Here it's a little different. So one chapter is, is still a solid chunk of the adventure, but it'll still be about one, one chapter per video. Um, and it'll be about an hour. Um, and then we're going to cover in that hour, we're going to cover the important plot points that you need to know, like the most important stuff that you need to know. And you will basically the most important NPCs that you need to prep for battle tactics for any of these big fights. So, cause some of these monsters or, or NPCs have interesting abilities that can be forgotten in the moment. So I'll highlight those abilities that you need to sort of be aware of to make the fights more interesting. And if you're tuned in live, like phenomenally CJ is and some other people in chat, uh, I'll be answering any live questions that you may have if you two are running it, if you tune in during the live stream. Um, and my hope is that by watching me talk through these things, it will give you a better foundation for when you take the adventure yourself and inevitably make it your own style, make your own changes, make your own spin. As long as you have these core building blocks down, the rest you can sprinkle into place easily, change and get it ready but I'm gonna cover the stuff that I feel like if you know it and you're really, really solid with it, your players are gonna have a great experience and you as a GM will have a great experience. So going back to what I said earlier about the idea that we don't get as much traction as you might in some of the other videos, it makes sense, right? Because these videos are for GMs only and there's a lot less GMs than there are players, right? Like that's just how the nature of the hobby everyone wants to play is very rare to find a GM, but all of this that you're seeing is made possible thanks to our patrons that are supporting us on Patreon. So I'm going to give them a quick shout out right here on the screen. Our Patreon supporters, uh, thank you, David Sims, Derek Brewer, Sandra Wagner. They are our, our biggest supporters right now that are supporting at the tier that allows us to give shout outs in all our videos and all our content. So I wanted to make sure to do that. We appreciate your support and this video would not be possible without you guys making it so. So Patreon allows us to sort of supplement the, the views, you know, we might not get as many views on these video series as we will on some of our other stuff, but that's fine because if you as a GM find it useful, we need the support of GMs like you to help us out. So if you want to consider supporting us, uh, you can head on over to patreon.com slash recall knowledge, sign up. Um, I currently also have added a stretch goal. So once as a whole channel, our Patreon gets to over $100 a month. That's actually going to trigger me to go back and finish the Abomination Vault prep series because the GMs keep asking for it and say, hey, is it there? So I'm putting the ball in your court audience. If you want to see the, the Abomination Vault's adventure path finish with the GM prep, go sign up for our Patreon. Otherwise, I'm going to continue with this Outlaws of Alchemstar one, uh, at least through the first book, and see how, how it's going. Um, and also, this is a good point, time to shout out, behind the scenes, 
we're actually working on making some Alkenstar focused content for GMs, especially maps. So Rick and Richard, who are part of the Recall Knowledge cast, they're, they like making maps. And there are a few gaps in the maps that are provided as part of the adventure path. So we're going to fill those gaps with uh, maps that we're making, as well as some random encounter maps that you might want to use. So if you're a GM, it's worth dropping in and checking out. That's pretty cool. Uh, we already have a, our first map pack has been released. It's not Alkenstar focused, but we are trying to make content for GMs that you guys will find interesting. And uh, if you sign up and you have other content in mind, definitely let me know because I'm trying to curate a space for you so that we can have these sort of videos. So thank you for that. And if you're not able to support on Patreon, we still love your support for watching. Thanks. But for those of you who can, thanks so much. So I think with that out of the way, let's dive into talking about Outlaws of Alkenstar. So I'm going to, let's see, switch this over real quick. So I have, you know, the, the PDF open here. So I guess the first thing we need to talk about is sort of the giant, as a, as a looking at Alkenstar from space, what is this Outlaws of Alkenstar adventure path about? And so really, I think it boils down to four main themes. So the first theme is Outlaws, right? Unlike most adventures where you're, characters are generally expected to sort of be heroic quote unquote here things shake out a little differently at the start of the adventure your hero will actually be an outlaw now what this means is they start off on the wrong side of the law whether that's because they're like an actual career criminal or whether it's because they were somehow wrongly set up or framed uh it doesn't matter the fact is everyone should be in a position where they cannot just sort of go to the local law enforcement to solve the problem. And uh, that is where the outlaws of Alkenstar comes from. Now, ultimately, this sort of outlaw business seems to be more of a catchy title and less of an underlying theme in the adventure path. Um, it's definitely true for the start. But directly after the first chapter of the first book of the adventure path, the characters were going to be conscripted into working for the city itself. Now, this is less of a like undercover cop showing your badges and walking around, kind of like uh, Agents of Edgewatch was. Uh, this is definitely more of a Suicide Squad level deal where they are kind of strong-armed into doing what needs to be done for the city in a sort of black market way so they can operate outside the law. So what they're doing... They're doing for the good of the city. They're also doing it however they want without the confines of the law getting in their way, which allows them to be a little fun. Um, and it allows them to sort of explore that morally gray area that you might not get in other adventure paths. Uh, and the number one thing, though, is that they're not driven by the heroics. They are driven by revenge. So that brings us to theme two in the adventure path is revenge. So there are two core villains in this adventure path. The first is the halfling business mogul, Ambrose Mugland. And the second is the corrupt shield marshal, Angelique Loveless. And I do have images of these. So if I, if I load uh, book two here on the cover, this is Ambrose Mugland, this little Halfling dude, he's got this the cigar in his mouth, he's got the gun poked in, he's got the barefoot halfling, and you know, he's just got he's just got that smug look about him, you know, like you just want to punch him in the face. Honestly, for my money, he looks just like Howard Hamlin from Better Call Saul. And that's I don't know if that's me uh, actually meant to be, but to me it really does. Um and then we also have Angelique Loveless, and she's has some art here right at the start of the campaign. She's right here on the left hand side. Um She's, you know, an, an elf. She's got the uh, the graying hair, the gunmetal gray hair. She sh shoots the, sh the rifle. She's an excellent sniper. She's a shield marshal. And she's got heterochromia, so she's got different color eyes. Um, together, they're actually working to sell off a new dangerous explosive chemical compound to the rival nations, right? 
uh, that that could potentially spell bad news for Alkenstar. Uh, they don't care what it's going to do to the power balance of the region. They just want to make their money and line their pocketbooks. And so in an effort to give the party motivation and revenge, every character should have a connection to one of these two criminals in their backstory. And so in the Outlaws of Alkenstar's Player's Guide... There's actually tons of backgrounds that are specifically tied to this, and I can bring up the the player's guide and show some of these backgrounds. Um, Banish Brigade, framed in Ferris Quarter, inexplicably spelled. You should have one of these backgrounds, or you should at least have a way inspired by one of these backgrounds that one of these two villains has wronged you in the past before the start of the adventure. Um I did a video talking about this in the, the Outlaws of Arkansas Player's Guide. You can go check that out. It's got some cool information. It's mostly player-facing. Um, but one way or another, they either got you fired from your job and or expelled from your school, set you up in some way as a patsy, or, you know, you saw something that you weren't supposed to, and they in they somehow put a want wanted like bounty on your head. Either way... You know that they wronged you, and you know that they deserve some payback. Okay? Your character, above anything else in this AP, is really going to want revenge against one of these two. And, for the record, you will directly face these two in battle. I know for sure that Mugland you fight in Book 2 at the climax of the adventure arc, so right at the end of the adventure you're going to have a fight with him, and... I'm 99% sure you face down Loveless at the end of book three. However, as of the this recording, book three isn't actually out yet. So we don't know for sure. But I'm 99% sure. And the synopsis, which we'll cover later, does make it seem like it anyways. All right. So after Revenge, the next theme, Steampunk Western. That's right. So, Alkenstar is this unique feel that you don't get anywhere else in the region, anywhere else on Galarian. And that is because, as part of its lore and its background, two of the most magical nations on the planet, Nex and Geb, surround where Alkenstar sits. And a centuries-long war has scarred the region so that magic is unpredictable like just works unpredictably now in the past lore first edition pathfinder which i researched for this uh upcoming adventure path it was said that the dwarven sky fortress of dongan hold eventually was tired of being passed back and forth and used as sort of a battlefield between these two nations and so it put out an anti-magic field in the region that completely shut down all magic which meant Neither side could really effectively use it, which caused both sides to sort of abandon it. Um, and when the dwarves did that, they abandoned their dwarven holds and went back down under the earth. And it just was left as this sort of magic dead region. Now, in the current lore, this sort of background is kind of glossed over. And so magic is now only called like unpredictable at best. And they there's a concept of like bronze time and surge time that's not spelled out in the rules or what it means at all so magic at least within the city of alkenstar functions normally by default and you can have the no magic option if if you want to run it like that which our table sort of is either way the end result is that instead of developing like the rest of the world you know where magic is sort of the main technology that everyone uses here actual technology has developed in place of the magic things like clockwork contraptions which are mindless machines that sort of get wound up like an old clock and can be given simple commands to do uh they have like flourished in a place like this uh alchemy has been achieved greater heights than seen anywhere else on the the whole planet um we have airships we have clockwork cars we have mo clockwork motorbikes we got all kinds of alchemical masterpieces. 
We have smog-filled industry giving a thick layer of smoke and smog over the whole city, which is why it's called the city of smog. And they all thrive here in this oasis in the middle of the spell-scarred desert. And you can't mention Alkenstar without the primary thing that most people think of, and that is black powder the most magnificent innovation of all. So it's a closely guarded secret that the dwarves of Dongan hold developed and shared with Alkenstar. And that is the black powder, which is gunpowder, uh, and the creation and use of firearms as a weapon. So they're created, sold, exported, very much under strict control from here in the Alkenstar region, um, which of course leads into our fourth and final major theme Firearms. Now, firearms definitely play a prominent role in this campaign, and especially given the current climate in the United States, at least, uh, it can be a sensitive topic to bring to a, a role-playing table. Um, there's so much craziness in the world right now, but it is going to be a central core theme to this adventure. And the main which is cool in some ways, right? Because in Pathfinder lore, gunslingers is a class they offer, but gunslingers don't exist. Or they're uncommon in other parts of the world because it's really hard to get firearms. Here in Alkenstar, the birthplace of the, these firearms, they're common. So this is the perfect place for your character, your players to play something a little different and really shine, and it doesn't feel like you're bringing a firearm to, like, strength of a thousands or the abomination of walls, right? It, it makes sense here and allows them to ex kind of flex within that space, which is, which can be cool. Uh, as long as, you know, you know, there's no getting around it, right? The main sort of driving plot in this whole adventure path is a new black powder replacement, which is called Pyronite. It's powerful enough to basically render black powder obsolete. And it'll be like the next evolution of firearms into the next sort of like stage and really allow firearms to be way more powerful than they are. Um, even if your PCs aren't using firearms themselves, many of the enemies do. Um, so there's no getting away from that. You got to be ready to embrace the firearms in your fantasy. And some people don't like firearms in fantasy. You got to embrace it for this adventure path for sure. It's important to note that the way firearms are designed in Pathfinder don't make them more powerful than other things. Like, for instance, one of our gunslingers uses a dueling pistol, and I think the base damage is a D4. It's not particularly, you know, strong, but, like, firearms kind of have this niche where when you crit, they have, like, deadly dice and fatal dice, and they deal tons of damage on crits. So... Just embrace it, just go with it, and be ready because there are going to be lots of shootouts in this Western feeling adventure. It is in the Wild West. It is this final frontier. You know, you got uh, wooden streets. You got tumbleweeds blowing down the street. You got corrupt shield marshals upholding some semblance of law in this, like, a, like refuge town. Like, it, it's pretty cool. Oh, I'm hearing from CJ there's a gunslinger in quest for, oh, gunslinger in quest for the for, for the stream. I thought you were saying there was some some gunslinger specific stuff. That would be interesting to run a gunslinger in quest for the frozen flame for sure. So, the interesting thing is even though it's like this western punk, it's up to you as the GM to put that sort of western flavor because the adventure path itself just kind of runs like a normal adventure path uh one thing we're missing for sure is like a deep lore flavor for Alkenstar. The only real deep lore dive that exists exists in an old first edition adventure called Wardens of the Reborn Forge. And there's a whole appendix dedicated to Alkenstar here. However, it's it's kind of outdated, right? Because it's first edition. And there's a there's like a paragraph about Alkenstar here in the uh, world guide. Like a couple paragraphs maybe. Not much. So it's up to the GM to really give this Alkenstar the Western feel, the steampunk flavor. So if you're not a fan of Westerns, you could actually probably change the theme, right? Just make it straight up steampunk. So anyways, 
that's sort of the main themes of the campaign. Um, it's it's a revenge filled romp as your players try to dish back what they were given to these two villains, and in the process maybe save a potential catastrophic event from unfolding. <laughs> um, oh yes, like Arcane. Arcane is a very, very good sort of uh, feel. I watched. I hadn't watched it. I watched Arcane. It's on Netflix. It's like a League of Legends themed uh, show. I never played League of Legends, but that really embodies the feel. So if you want to get the feel for how I think Alkenstar should write, be running look, that has so many parallels with the city. It's pretty cool. All right, so let's move on to the next sort of main thing, which is the main overview of the adventure path. So I'm going to do some lore drop, some backstory lore drop, and I think it might even be some of this is mentioned in this, like, block here. Uh, however, this this is stuff that doesn't necessarily come up in the adventure path and isn't even presented in the play in the guide as a whole, but I think it's important for you as a GM to picture this in your head to really set the scene for why the city is the way it is. So, Alkenstar. Before Alkenstar even existed, a long, long, long time ago, basically negative 892 AR according to this PDF, uh, the dwarves came up from the underground and built a massive sky fortress that they called Dongan Hold on the surface. Uh, dwarves, before then, lived on the ground. They were, they were kind of driven by their deity to go up to the surface, and they did. Um, once they were there and they had the Sky Fortress, they got caught in a war between two very magical nations, Nex and Geb. And this is one of those things, right? Is it Geb or is it Jeb? Is it Gif or is it Jif? I think it's Geb. That's what I'm saying. Nex, to the north, uh, is a region with like some of the greatest arcanists anywhere on the planet their magical abilities are basically unparalleled to the south is geb it's sort of the main driver of necromancy they command undead armies they're backed up at the sort of like divine and arcane spellcasters and they marched up and had a war against uh next so dongan hold was actually held as like a point of interest between both sides of the war over many, many years. And eventually the dwarves had enough. They said, F this, we don't want this anymore. They set off a anti-magic nuke, which, boom, this huge anti-magic radius, it, it functioned as like a level nine anti-magic field um, that went all the way from Dongenhold towards like the Ustradi River. And then they, they basically locked the front door and went back underground. I said, screw this, we're out of here. Uh, that didn't bode well for Nex and Geb because their entire war strategy revolved around, and their entire society revolved around magic. So they kind of gave this place a wide berth. There was no longer a strategic need to hold it. And Dongenhold sort of just was abandoned. The whole area was just abandoned. Still in the middle of this like desert where there's been so much war that the, the entire plane itself is just scarred from the magical outfall of the war. And so in the places where magic works outside of this anti-magic zone, it still doesn't work predictably. And eventually it sort of was this cold war, no man land zone, right? Uh, and in the shadow of this war that continued raging on, and it looks, the war ended at 576, uh, 4,000 years later, that's a long time, a man named Ansel Alkenstar, uh, Alkenstar, right? He fled Nex because he was uh, avoiding arrest, right? He was an outlaw. He found Dongan Hold, and he realized he was safe from his pursuers because no magic wizard could scry on him. They couldn't teleport to him. He was safe here as long as he stayed close to this place, right? Where magic was unpredictable and or didn't work. Um, so once he was there, he actually went on to establish a new nation, not just a city, a whole nation that he called the Grand Duchy of Alkenstar. And they named the capital city Alkenstar City. 
So a lot of times, a lot of the lore you're going to read, this is why it gets confusing, because Alkenstar is the name of a city. It's also the name of a region. It's also the name of a person, right? Just know that there is a, a nation called Alkenstar, which contains the whole region. There's a city called Alkenstar, and it was all founded by this man named Alkenstar. Uh, and so eventually, Alkenstar grew big enough. He set out with some adventurers and found the dwarves who actually abandoned Danganhold. They went underground, they found him, they convinced them to come back up to the surface. And the dwarves, when they opened the Danganhold, they returned with something that they had been working on and perfecting for all these years, and that was the black powder itself. They had perfected the use of this explosive and they realize now with the magic sort of zone being what it is, this practical use of alchemy and explosives could be a way for the city to, do, to defend itself. And that's what they did. They shared their weapons with Algonstar who helped defend Danganhold. And they kind of like helped each other grow and grow in power as time went on. And they're still separate and distinct, right? Danganhold is different from Alkenstar. They don't consider themselves part of the the duchy but you know they are there in proximity uh but both nations thrive with the ability to defend themselves to these mutants and the horrors that come out of the mana waste it was really hard for anyone to actually attack and so alkenstar grew um it became a safe place for anyone seeking refuge from nex or geb they could flee come to the city come to the walled city and basically have a fresh start. No magic, but plenty of jobs, plenty of technology, plenty of factories, smoke started going up. You want a job, come here, work in the factory, make a good living. Things are gonna be great for you, right? Um, but ultimately what's important to know is that black powder is what gives power here. It is. Still, though, it's a highly, highly guarded secret. It's not public knowledge how to make these things. In fact, all the guns themselves, the firearms, are made at a place called the Gunworks. So I'm going to share this map real quick. This shows, like, kind of what the Impossible Lands look like. We have Nex as a nation on here and Geb on the nation on the bottom. Technically, their borders touched each other before Alkenstar sort of, like, showed up and declared itself its own nation. Um, in this kind of no man land zone between the mana waste, uh, the mana waste between the two cities. I believe it's Nex who still legally claims the right to Alkenstar because they were the last city to hold it. So there's never been a challenge from Nex to go back and take Alkenstar over. Nex considers Alkenstar part of them. them. Alkenstar considers itself its own city state, as does most of the world at this point. And we can see Alkenstar, the city, is here on the edge of this river. And all the way up where this lake is, is this gunworks. And we can see, according to this guide at the bottom, it's it's like 100 miles from Alkenstar to the gunworks. And we'll know more when book three releases because you go to the gunworks in book three of this adventure path. But just know that where the guns are made are not in the city itself, despite some of the lore talking about how they're made in the heart of Alkenstar. That's where you get confused between the Alkenstar city, the Alkenstar region. The Gunworks is a distinct building way up river, 100 miles from Alkenstar, where the guns are made in secret and then shipped over to Alkenstar and very carefully, uh, well, not so carefully, right? Because everyone gets their hands on it, but it's supposed to be carefully registered by the city. So um, only licensed people are actually permitted to carry firearms. Typically, only people that are the shield marshals that work for the government. But that doesn't stop criminals from getting the, the their hands on the firearms. And those who get their hands on firearms are able to be very powerful here. So, you know, firearm gives power. Power gives money. Money gives more firearms, which begets more power. And it's a cyclical nature where the outlaws can gain power just by having their hands on firearms here. So you're not going to walk into the corner and just be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to go to the corner gun store and get my gun upgraded. No, no, no. You're talking, I'm talking to black market people who got a firearm that fell off the back of the truck and are selling it for you for a good price. This is also reflective in how the prices on, every, on all the firearms 
are pretty expensive in the handbook because you can't just buy them on the street corner, right? But over time, as Alkenstar grows, the technology just gets better and better and better. Clockwork creatures are eventually generated. And these are like, they're not AI, they're not automated, they're not like fully sentient creatures, but they are smart enough that they can do simple tasks. You can make a robot, wind it up and say, guard this room. And while that thing, you know, last, it can be wound up for 24 hours or however long, once it's activated, it'll do whatever it was commanded within simple reason. Um, and then it needs to be rewound in order to continue to function. But what this did is it allowed very dangerous, simple jobs to be automated. The factories who previously could just have people come in and work these jobs and make a decent living, they automated a lot of this. The machines took over. The machines were working these dangerous things. People weren't being hurt anymore, but they were driven out of their jobs. And most of the jobs kind of shifted from the poor workers just wanting to go work in a factory to the engineers and people who made the the robots and not robots but the the clockworks in the first place um this has caught a lot caused a lot of resentment towards the clockworks from the working class uh of course because they don't like having their jobs automated the local population sees them as like threatening to them despite the fact that they elevate the standard of living up it's not good for them as a people and so they're not fond of them losing their jobs Thank you. That was my son. Uh, and so it has led to this power struggle where the people don't like the clockworks. The clockworks make everything better. And it's just really driven a wedge in the wealth disparity between those who have and those who haven't. And we can see that most in Alkenstar. And um, I think if I show you here on the foundry, this is where you're going to see it the most. So this is Alkenstar and what it looks like as a whole. It is this walled city. There is this river that flows through the middle. It's called the Ustradi River. Um, if you follow this river this way, south, and then east, or sorry, west, you're going to get to the gunworks. And right here in the middle of the city, this is a 200-foot waterfall called, you know, the Hellfall and Cliffs Waterfall, where the city itself is 200 feet up, and there's a waterfall that just right in the middle of the city. Um, so the north side of the city is protected by 200 feet of cliff, and the walls elsewhere protect from, you know, the desert storms and anything else going on there. But we see the divide between those who have and those who have not most with the division of what we call smoke side and sky side. Smoke side is the anything north of the Ustradi River. And that is where uh, the factories are most pre prevalent. Um, that is where the poorer sections of the cities are. That's where you can't really see the sky because when you look up, all you see is a thick layer of smog 24 hours a day, seven days a week, blocking out the sky. It's crafted out of this very beautiful sort of metal and machinery and brass, and it's covered in so much thick grime that you never would see the beauty hiding underneath. It is full of people that like have the black lung, like, <laughs> Pop, I have the black lung! Right, people who die for their job and kill for the privilege to work this job that kills them because it's the only chance they have it in existence. And conversely, on the other side of the river, we have Skyside. Skyside is where the colleges are. This is where the, the airship fields are. This is where Grayson's towers reach the sky, go so high that it pierces the smog and allows the richest people to see the beautiful sky. It is an expensive place to live. It's where the richest people live those in business those in industry and it is you know it's not se it's separated by a bridge it's separated by the river and interestingly in the history of the lore of the city where the anti-magic field it only affected smoke side it only affected this region north of the Ustradi. and sky side magic used to work normally or at least as normally as unpredictable could be but it was not under an anti-magic field so the, all the factories worked on smoke side and on sky side. You'd have like an actual wizard's college, the only wizard's college in the entire place. Um, but the division of this city is a huge plot point that really should influence your thought and your take on the city. The haves, the haves nots, 
those who, you know, live in Smokeside, those who live in Skyside, those who have a chance to love or appreciate the standard of living that's up there, and those who die hungry on the streets with no job. Currently, the city is actually led by the Duchess Trietta Riccia. And uh, Trietta is a name that I'm not entirely sure if that's the correct pronunciation, but I, I believe I believe it's right. Um, let me show you what she looks like real quick. So this is the Pathfinder 1E uh, image of the Duchess. She's got this beautiful red dress um, and got this headband. And then if we go over to the Alkenstar um, notable figure, you can see she's right here in her hat with this like tip of the hat, that Western style tip of the hat. Now I have been sort of clued in on something that I think is going to be revealed in book three. So this is like a spoiler that I don't know the answer to yet, but if you look here, right, look at her headband, right? Let me zoom in a little bit. Look at this headband and this like image and this thing that she wears. If we look at here, she's got the exact same device on her hat. This device, this sort of thing, this is something that's going to be important. And I hope it's something that we get uh, answered as to what it means. But there's got to be some secret that she has that we don't know about. And I'm really interested to know what it is. But that's my, my spoiler tip coming down the pipe. But that is uh, that is the sort of history of of. Alkenstar Adventure Path um, leading up to here. I think the only other thing that's worth knowing is um, it's kind of in the book itself, right? So everything I've talked about now is kind of outside the book and just lore that exists in the world. But let's talk about like the actual book itself, right? There is an eccentric alchemist named Vashon Gattleby. And he has created his latest invention, a volatile liquid called Pyronite. He did a demonstration for it, and you can see the image of it here. He took a, a pea-sized amount of this stuff to prove that it could blow the lock off like a very protective safe, right? During his demonstration, it was so powerful that the door flew off, half, the entire like room was destroyed, the safe door went into the audience and almost killed people. The entire college, Blyther College, the entire lecture hall was destroyed from one pea-sized drop of this pyronite. Gattleby, who miscalculated his the power, was devastated. He went recluse, he went back to his house, and he started his calculation to figure out what went wrong. Why did that happen? Why was I so wrong? What did I mess up? I failed. The more astute people in the audience, like our antagonist for the adventure <laughs> Richard stopping by hi Richard uh, Gattleby saw it as a failure Mugland did not Mugland saw the power in this and realized I have just beheld what will be the future of this city black powder is a thing of the past this is the wave of the future and if I can be the one who controls it if I can get my hands on the formula, I could be rich beyond my wildest dreams. This is the opportunity I've been waiting for. At the same time, those in power within the city had the same fear. So we start a cat and mouse kind of game where Ambrose Muglin needs to get his hands on this formula. He has put himself into such debt he spent all of his money. He's bribed all the people he could. He's hired all the people he can. You know, he's already lined up buyers for this explosive who are from, spoilers, Nex and Geb, those cities, the ones that want to kind of destroy each other and or Alkenstar in the middle. He's selling to the, like, bitter rivals of this city because he doesn't care. He just wants a payday. And they kind of want to use it you know, he doesn't know what they want to use it for. In fact, he thinks they're kind of working together. He just doesn't care. Um, and so that's where we sort of pick up, right? That is the, that is what lights off this adventure path. Gat will be doing that. Um, our players who have been 
brought in to get their revenge because they don't like Muglin. They also don't like Loveless. Loveless works very close with Muglin. She's in his pocket. He pays her to do his dirty work. They kind of become the focus for the city, right? For this lady named Phoebe Dunsmith who works for Alkenstar in like a secret sort of suicide squad manner. She, she breaks a lot to make sure things stay safe. She kind of coerces these, your outlaws, your PCs to going after Muglin and going after Loveless and will use them to basically secure the Pyronite formula for themselves to make sure it doesn't fall into the wrong hands and to make sure that the city stays safe because Pyronite's too powerful to be in, you know, the world for now. And that is the backstory leading towards the, uh, the, the adventure path. It's important to note that the clock's ticking on Muglin. So far, he hasn't been able to get the formula. Gattleby has resisted all efforts. And uh, Muglin is kind of running out of money. Uh, he doesn't have money to pay off the people he needs to. He's put everything he has into this job. And if it goes wrong, if, if the PCs are able to thwart this, Muglin is screwed because he owes money to the wrong people. So that's kind of cool. So let's talk about at a high level now, since we've talked about the campaign background, at a high level, what is the Outlaws of Alkastar Adventure Path? So it's actually three books. The three books are Punks in a Powder Keg, Cradle of Quartz, and The Smoking Gun. So each one of these has a sort of quick down and dirty uh, synopsis that I'll read really quick. So punks in a powder keg. To impress a mysterious patron who promises to help them get revenge against their rivals, that's Phoebe, the characters rob Ambrose Muglin's illicit banking operations, the Gold Tank Reserve, and that's what chapter one is. Afterward, the humble bartender Phoebe Dunsmith reveals that she's actually an informant for Alkenstar's Grand Duchess. She then gives the mercenaries their next mission, protect the famous alchemist Vashon Gattleby from kidnappers while escorting them across the city to safety. That's chapter two. Two street gangs waylay the party and attempt to abscond with Gattleby. The Clearwater Cleaners are obviously working for Mugland. But the Powder Keg Punks, which is the name of another gang and the title of the book, uh, motives are a mystery. After they get Gattleby to the safe house, the character's investigation reveals that Gattleby's small-time rival, another alchemist named Shuma Lysarius, paid the punks to apprehend Gattleby. To put a stop to the renegade alchemist schemes, the characters track down Lysarius in the ramshackle district of Hellside. And that's the cover here when we see with the exploding uh, thing in the back in Hellside. Uh, the PCs go there to face him down and... It's full of explosives, and there's going to be an explosive ending to this adventure path, theoretically. So that's synopsis for book one. Let's talk about book two, Cradle of Quartz. Phoebe Densmith hires the characters to locate a Prista Brig, Brig, I don't know how to say it, Brig, uh, named Olamon Kosawana, who has somehow reversed engineered the, ex the dangerous explosive called Pyronite. Oops. The formula was reverse engineered by another alchemist. How did they do it? Uh, when they go to the Kosawana's home, the priest's clockwork laboratory has already been ransacked. Fortunately, Kosawana had enough time to leave a clue for the characters to track him down at the Cradle of Quartz, a remote shrine to Brig in the middle of the Spellscar Desert. It, it kind of undersells it here. There's an explosion that like destroys a bunch of stuff and then skedaddles out of town. Uh, yeah, Pyronite has definitely been reverse engineered. After an, arranging for an ill-fated airship journey to the desert and surviving the wasteland's strange cosmic horrors, yes, we do get on an airship, and yes, you do get to go into the desert and potentially crash in the desert and uh, hoof it the rest of the way, but we do get airship uh, uh, scenes in here, which is pretty cool. The characters rescue Kosawana from the malevolent inhabitants of the Cradle of Quartz, this temple of Brig that exists in the desert. The outlaws then learn from the priest that their rival, Ambrose Muglin, has gotten a hold of Kosawana's recipe for Pyronite. And he's actually hired a gang called the Gilded Gunners to test it at the Steaming Kingdom, a rival business owner's saloon, or speakeasy. 
The characters have to stop the assault and then use their clues to finally track down Mugland and get their revenge once and for all. Before his fate is sealed, Muglin will reveal that he's already sold the formula to the pair of renegades from Nex and Geb. Oh no. Which leads us into the third book of the adventure path, The Smoking Gun. <laughs> By Richard. Richard says he's muted it. I don't know if I believe him. Uh, Grand Duchess, so Smoking Gun. Grand Duchess Trieta Ricia herself approaches the characters and explains that the Pyronite situation has become dire. Unless the party can locate Deputy Loveless and Muglin's Pyronite buyers before they use the bombs, the safety of all of Alkenstar is threatened. The outlaw's best lead takes them to the gunworks far west of Alkenstar. We're going back 100 miles west, right, towards uh, the gunworks, where they learn more about the Pyronite buyers. A necromancer from Geb named Parsis and a Nexian geomancer named Ibrium and their potential plot to level Alkin Falls using Pyronite. That's right. They want to blow up the 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 uh, the hydro plant, the power plant, and the screw, and destroy the waterfall. Really putting a stop to like Alkin Star's main trade hub. The outlaws infiltrate the tin wound hydro forge at Alkin Falls, where Parseus has used necromantic powers to fill the water purification plant with undead minions. That's right. We're going through the zombies and skeletons and we're fighting undead hordes. The Necromancer has cleared the place for Ibrahim and Loveless to load it full of Pyronite. Once defeated, Parseus explains that Ibrahim and Loveless are on an inbound luxury riverboat, Pyronite in hand. To save the day, the outlaws must board a casino boat called the Gear Smoke. As it cruises down the Estradi River, they sneak about the, the vessel to disarm the Pyronite and to defeat Deputy Loveless and Ibrium, upending the villain's plot once and for all, securing Pyronite once and for all, and I guess making the choice whether they keep it secret, use it for their own nefarious plans, clear their name, we don't know. But that in and of itself is the entire arc from beginning to end. Um, it involves political intrigue, it involves high explosions, it involves necromancers, it involves casino boats, it sounds like pretty cool, like sort of like Western take. Uh, for me, it's very different from like the sort of Abomination Vaults where you go down and there's this like central villain at the bottom that you know you're working towards the whole time that's like threatening everything. It has a different feel, but the stakes are still the same, right? You're trying to A, get revenge, but B, save the city, right? Um, you know Loveless is there from the beginning and you're going to face her at the very end. I am surprised personally that Mugland isn't the main villain, that Loveless becomes the main villain, but she is a more combat capable character. So I'm interested to see that last book and make sure you do fight her and just how powerful her gunslinging abilities are. Um, as far as specific things, right? With Punks and a Powder Keg, because with this book is out, we can look at more like chapter level stuff, right? Chapter one, Reach for the Sky and Punks and a Powder Keg. Under the guidance of a mysterious patron named Phoebe Dunsmith, the characters pull off a daring heist to steal from the Gold Tank Reserve, a small bank owned by Mugland. Then they're pursued by Angelique Loveless and their goons. They finally go through a, a scrapyard. They get back safe at the Barrel and Bullet Saloon. And then they learn, oh, I actually, you actually work for the city. Now you work for me. Chapter 2, they advance to level 2. Chapter 2, Running Gun. Dunsmith asks the characters to escort alchemist Vashon Gattleby, the inventor of Pyronite, across the city. Uh, Gattleby has his own idea, which is like, I'll go, but you have to take me by a, my old brewery. I need to stop by there. So he does, you, you have to protect him to the brewery, take him there, let him get whatever he goes for, and then take him back to the Barrel and Bullet Saloon as a sort of safety safe uh keeping um and that is the entirety of chapter two is moving him it's like a giant escort mission across the city where you're like it's one of those escort missions probably where like the npc walks slower than you can run but faster than you can walk you know that annoying kind of escort mission that's probably what this is going to feel like and then they advance to level three and chapter three turn the screws 
because there's two random gangs attack, one that they know works for Mugman, nobody knows what the other gang's motives are, they have to investigate the gang. Um, by sleuthing around, they're going to learn that the culprit is an Ifrit, like an alchemist named Shuma, or Shoma, a uh, je jealous rival of Gattleby's, and uh, he's hiding out in the hell side, and the PCs have to go confront him and figure out what's going on when he, he reveals, hey, guess what? Pyronite's not a secret. It's already been figured out. And um, that kind of sets off the end of book one and the next arc of the Pyronite uh, being out in the wild. Uh, interesting to note that, like, Shuma is just, Shoma is basically jealous and thinks that his work was stolen and leveraged by Gattleby, although there's no reason that, it's not a reasonable thing, just that he happened to make an explosive one time, so Gattleby obviously stole his idea. Uh, but he's driven by such, like, anger and revenge and, like, not revenge, uh, he just can't face the fact they might not be the best, that it caused him to go to great lengths. And, uh, it's a little weird to me that the boss for the entire adventure path doesn't really come into place until the last arc. Like you don't know who he is. You don't know who he is. You learn about him and you kill him. I liked, I, I feel like there's there gotta be a way that we can tie Shoma into the story earlier. So there's a payoff at the end back to him. And I don't know how we're going to do that. But I want to try to do that. Um, it, it's just interesting to me that, that, that is really, the, the boss of the first AP is the random alchemist named Shoma. All right, then we move on to Cradle of Quartz, which has four chapters instead of the three that the first one has. So in the Cradle of Quartz, the characters start at fourth level. After learning that the priest of Brig reverse engineered the formula for Pyronite, they have to track down the missing man to discover what kind of formula exactly was leaked. They have to, except for nobody knows where Kosawana is, they have to figure out where the cleric is by investigating his trap-laden workshop. Okay? Just like Gattleby's house, which is full of traps, which we'll talk about next time, uh, or in a couple of weeks, <laughs> this alchemist booby traps their house too. So once they find out that they've left to this temple called the Cradle of Quartz, they have to go there in an airship deep in the, the Spellscar Desert. Um, they have to get convince this airship captain to fly them. They have to protect the airship from everything that attacks. Eventually, it fails. It either crashes really close or really far, depending on how well the PCs do. And then they have to finish the rest of the travel on foot through the Spell Scar Desert until they reach the, the temple. Uh, the party reaches the temple, and they, um, they become six level. Uh, they have to go into the shrine called the Cradle of Quartz. Now, the, the story with the Cradle of Quartz is it was built by people who were super worried about, what is it, the, the, interested in the flow of time, time travel, time manipulation, stuff like that. So the, the lore is the secret for time travel was, was basically at this temple. So when you go here, the PCs are trying to learn, like, like, oh, is there possibly a way to go back and stop Pyronet from ever being invented, et cetera, et cetera? Um, no, the answer is no. It's actually sort of a false thing where the temple was never actually, never actually uncovered those secrets, but the person who sort of was the creator of it sort of let people think they did, I guess. So it went on the books as like a place for that. And then it was lost. It was considered forbidden knowledge and filed away. So the temples couldn't go there anymore. Um, but what it has done is it's summoned a creature that is from a God that really hates time travel. And so this creature has taken over the temple and it's this weird sort of otherworldly outer God, creepy thing that can kind of like come out of corners and get boost when it's in like corners or rooms and stuff. And uh, I forget what it's called, but it's a really creepy sort of fight. And at the end, they come back to Alkenstar, uh, failing at um, going back in time, but finding out that this person uh, has actually lost the formula. Um, Mugland already has it. And they return and they have to face down Mugland. He's actually, uh, by the time you get back to him, he's been taken kidnapped by one of the gangs, the Gilded Gunners, who 
he hired to get Gattleby because he can't afford to pay them. And so he's kind of held captive by the gang. And when the PCs show up, Muglin's already like a prisoner. And so they, if they want Muglin, they have to like make a deal with the gunners. And it's this kind of cool scene where the gunner offers them a chance for like, A, you can just fight and kill us all. B, you can pay me like 200 gold and uh, face my greatest warrior in a duel one-on-one. Or C, pay me 500 gold or cover all his debts and Gattleby's yours. Or sorry, Muglin's yours to do what you want. And so there is this interesting tense moment where the PCs have to basically get Muglin. And Muglin, of course, weasels his way out. And we'll have a showdown with the PCs at the end. And we'll see. Does Muglin live? Does Muglin not? We're not sure. And then... Unfortunately, the third book's not out yet, so we don't know exactly the story beats of the final, final campaign. Um, But there is a synopsis we have, which is, with the chips down and the cards stacked against them, our crew of vengeance-seeking vigilantes must infiltrate Alconstar's upper crust in order to clear their names and halt a villain's plot to bring the city to his knees. In this action-packed finale, the characters must pull off a daring high-rise heist at a garish gala, shut down a necromancer's shocking schemes in a volatile hydropower plant, and dismantle their last remaining rival's master plan aboard a luxury gearboat. So it sounds like we're going to the sky side. It sounds like we're breaking into a rich person's party, which is a very big contrast to the rest of the, rest of the stuff he's done. This adventure path sounds like it has does a good job about hitting all these different story beats, right? We're robbing a bank. We're in a scrapyard. We're escorting someone across the city. We're going to this random time temple in the middle of the Spellscar Desert. We're on an airship. We're back. We're facing down gangs. We're then going to like a rich party. We're trying to use espionage to get what we need out of the party. We're fighting zombies in like a power plant. And at the end, we're on a casino boat. I imagine we're either on the screw or near the top of the Alkenstar Falls when there's a final showdown with Muglin, uh, with Loveless and... Hopefully the PCs save the day or everything blows up. Either way, the future of Alkenstar is probably never going to be quite the same. So I know I've been talking for a long time. This is just the... It's been an hour so far. This is just the like story beat, high-level stuff that I think it's important for GMs to know. If you're going to run this adventure path, you need to know this sort of like story beat from beginning to end all the way. Um... I think it's it's pretty important to to know um, to really get a good feel for Alkenstar. Uh, let me just pull over here real quick. So it's really important to kind of see Alkenstar here, right? Like know the city, know the areas, right? We have Smokeside, and then you have different quarters: Steamhaven, Ferris Quarter, Stratty Heights, the Ironside Quarter, which isn't even in Alkenstar officially. We'll talk about that next week. We have the Capital District, the Auburn Hill, the Auburn District, Pilot Square. Blithier College, all these things um, in the city. Um, This is the point. I'm about to sign off. If you're in chat and you have any questions for me about anything I've said so far, anything you have questions about when you're running it that you want me to answer, just let me know. I will uh, will answer them. I'm just going to give, you know, a quick rundown of of Alkenstar. Um, uh, It's important to note that, like, to connect both sides, you have to go across this river. There's two bridges on the southern end, and there's this bridge up here. I believe one of these bridges is the old bridge that doesn't function very well, and one of these bridges is the new bridge, um, in the old lore at least. Uh, There's also this area called the high side, or the hell side, which we talked about in the adventure path. The ships that come up the river, right, they need to get up this 200-foot tall cliff. They've built this thing called the screw right here, and it's this giant metal pillar that can basically be raised up like a giant screw out of the bottom of the river and brings boats to the top it can carry multiple boats at a time but the whole process takes like 8 to 12 hours just to lift something up and bring it down so boats come down here and they have to like wait in dock and pay so they can go up so down here there is this um this area and it's called hellside people build these ramshackle wooden platform buildings on the cliffside all the way down to the water specifically so that they can do trade with the ships. This is how they make their living. They go out on boats. The boats take their boats to the docks at the bottom and it gives the sailors 
um, on the ship a place to come. It gives the people a way to do trade and make money. Um, and that's why Hellside exists, right? Um, and this screw sort of brings it up and down. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the cliffs themselves, right? 200 foot tall cliffs to get north towards the Spellscar get spell scar desert and in that direction is where the temple that they're going to visit actually is <coughs> there is a let's see do we have a let's see is there a yeah we have a we have an image of hellside so this is what hellside looks like from a side view map um you have the water down below with the docks and a way for people to get up and into the uh, city here and the city is just like all these little buildings. This really like it's only like ten feet wide wooden sidewalks with this like drop to your death on the side, um, and it's just this ram cycle city all city all the way up to the top where the actual city is. It's a pretty unique place. Uh, you definitely go there for the conclusion of episode one. This is where the hidden the the final showdown is, and there's like a house here packed with explosives and explosives and wooden buildings don't go very well together. Anyways, I hope I hope you've hopefully found this uh, lore dump interesting and intriguing for you. Um, I, I try to talk about a lot of stuff that wasn't in the books at the beginning. I tried to branch into the city itself, um, give kind of my feel on how the city should look, um, and how uh, and hit all the story beats of the adventure path. So now with future episodes, right, starting with the next episode, is I will be covering. An entire episode dedicated to chapter one of book one, Punks in a Powder Keg. And that is uh, called uh, Hands in the Sky. Um, I think that's what it was called. And it is uh, all about the bank robbery and the initial the initial introduction of Mugland robbing a bank, getting PC set up, and meeting Phoebe Dunsmith. And it's going to be uh, a lot of fun. Uh, it's an interesting chapter. There's a lot of choices. The adventure path sort of expects it to go one way, and I I've seen about like nine out of ten groups run it a different way than it was expected to be written, or run it different order than it was written. So I'll make sure to give you guys the the tips there. Um, doesn't look like we have any pertinent questions, so feel free to drop if you're watching this on YouTube later. Go ahead and drop in YouTube down below and, and ask your questions. Um, we also have a Discord. Um, if you're in Twitch right now, you can hit exclamation point discord and get a link to our discord um if you're on youtube look in the the link down below in the box there's the discord link there's a whole channel on our discord server dedicated to gm prep drop your questions in there and i'll try to answer them on the show uh again big big thanks to our patreon supporters who made this video possible david sims Derek brewer sandra wagner thank you thank you thank you if you want to see your name here and get a shout out as well Make sure to head on over to patreon.com slash recall knowledge and sign up and we can continue making more and hopefully go back and finish Abomination Vaults if that's your thing. So that's going to do it for episode one. Um, yeah, in the meantime, make sure you guys stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, we'll be back. Trying to think if there's any more super important information. I want. I, there's gonna be like a hundred things I remember that I wanted to say that I forgot in the heat of the moment. So that's just the nature of these things. I love being able to talk about this stuff. I hope as a GM or somebody running this, it, you found it interesting. And if you do, comment down below and let me know. So until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you guys later. Goodbye. Hi, Steve from Recall Knowledge here. If you enjoyed this content, please make sure to like and subscribe down below so you can get notified of more awesome content coming your way. Also, make sure to follow our channel's Twitter, at Recall Knowledge, for the latest information. Thanks for watching.